Um, dear colleagues, dear Dystonia Europe members, uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Dystonia Europe to the 25th anniversary uh, and to this wonderful conference. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the organizers of the conference for inviting me. It's the first time, I think, that I'm here at the Dystonia Europe conference, and I thank you all for the warm welcome. And it's now my honor and pleasure uh, to speak about uh, Focal Dystonia in Musicians, which is, uh, as you all may know, an uh, important and career-limiting medical problem, I think the most important medical problem in professional musicians. And in my talk, um, I will first briefly uh, repeat the phenomenology. I don't know if everyone knows what Musicians Dystonia is. In the second part, um, I will present current knowledge about the etiology uh, of Musicians Dystonia. In the third part, uh, I will cover some therapeutic options, the most used, I think. And uh, in the last part, um, I will pre uh, present possibilities to prevent this disease because prevention is a very important issue in musicians' dystonia. Um, so phenomenology. Musicians' dystonia presents with loss of voluntary motor control of highly trained movements when a musician is playing uh, his instrument. It's a task-specific disorder, meaning that the uh, contractions are only present on the instrument, normal neurological examination, and it's usually a painless uh, disorder, although pain can uh, occur in the, uh, at the beginning, but it's usually painless disorder. And musicians' dystonia is uh, confined to the upper limb or embouchure, and the frequency is estimated at about 1 to 2% uh, among professional musicians. And as I said, it's a highly disabling disorder, difficult to treat, and in many uh, cases terminates performance careers. And here I have an example of a professional guitarist. Pr probably some of you saw the video, but I did it. But Professor Altmüller uh, does also so show this video often. I showed it's a guitarist with a severe flexion dystonia of the right index finger. So you have to look at the right hand with compensatory extension of the first and fifth finger while he plays the guitar. So it's, of course, more, more severe and faster tempo. And when he plays the piece now. OK, it, it sounds very good, but I, I think you can imagine uh, that this is highly disabling for professional musicians and that it is very difficult to perform on their regular level with this disorder. So in Germany, uh, we have a long tradition with this disease. One of the first reported patients in the 19th uh, century was the famous German composer Robert Schumann. When Schumann was 21 years old, uh, he developed a severe uh, dystonia of the flexion dystonia of the right middle finger, and he had to give up his plans to become a, a pianist. He wanted to, to become a pianist, but uh, then he changed and uh, got composer. And um, in the time when the symptoms occurred in the right hand, Schumann composed this piece here, the Toccata. And in this piece, he avoided the use of the right third finger. So I, uh, I'm pianist myself, professional pianist, or I was professional pian pianist myself. And um, I can, uh, you can believe me that you can play all the notes at the beginning here. Uh, without the third finger of the right hand. It's, of course, more difficult, but you can play it without this finger. And uh, Schumann composed it in the time when, when he had the problems with the right hand. So it's always good for a musician who is affected with dystonia to take the right pieces. It's also a therapeutic approach, or could be a therapeutic approach. So now, what, what is the current knowledge about the uh, etiology of musicians' dystonia? So... Um, Several risk factors uh, have been described for uh, the development of musicians' dystonia, such as uh, a younger age. In 80% uh, 
uh, of the patients, dystonia begins uh, before the age of 40 years. So it's a real a difficult time period when the, when the musicians come out of their studies and then they develop the dystonia. Um, local pain or overuse syndromes in the affected body regions before the onset of dystonia is another risk factor. Then a professional position. Soloists are uh, predominantly affected uh, with the disorder compared to uh, teachers or tutists. Further risk factors include a high workload or high temporal spatial constraints on the instrument. So violinists uh, are, for example, um, uh, more common affected compared to double bass players. And the left hand in violinists is more affected compared to the right hand, and that's, that's due to the high workload and to the high demands uh, of the, of the left hand. You can probably imagine it when you look at a violinist. Um, then psychological conditions, I think that's really interesting. Um, anxiety, prominent anxiety and uh, perfectionism uh, is a risk factor. That's very interesting, classical music. 95% uh, of the affected musicians are classical musicians. So it's not a problem of pop musicians. And that's also, I think, uh, it, uh, I, I don't know how to say it in English. It, it's, a, it's a problem of the classical music that's interesting to, to learn. And it's uh, another risk factor is also the genetics. So males are more frequently affected compared to females. And epidemiologic studies show that about 10% of the patients report uh, a positive family history um, of dystonia. And musicians' dystonia has long been regarded as a textbook example of a solely environmentally acquired practice-induced uh, disease. So doctors said that the, that the patients ha have practiced wrong and therefore developed the dystonia. However, um, uh, an aggregation of different types of dystonia has been observed in the families, in families of musicians' dystonia patients, suggesting also uh, a genetic contribution and here's an example, an interesting example of monozygotic twins, uh, twin brothers. The index patient is a professional flutist um, who plays in a very good orchestra and who has a slight flexion dystonia of his left middle finger. Uh, it's difficult to see, but you have to, to listen and you might hear slight ir irregularities in the scale playing in the uh, left hand when he plays in a fast tempo. So this click sounds pretty normal. But here's, you may hear it. And interestingly, his monozygotic twin brother, who's also a professional flutist, also in a good Berlin orchestra, um, developed exactly uh, the same type of flexion dystonia of his left hand. So, Okay, so these are, this is a family where we thought that there might be a genetic uh, contribution. And uh, to elucidate whether there's indeed a genetic contribution to musicians' dystonia, we performed large uh, family studies in the past years, over the past years, and we examined a lot of families. I did that. I was in Germany, all over the Germany, sometimes in the European and neighboring countries, because the families were across, were all across Europe. So, and um, interestingly, about 30 or 30% 30 uh, of the patients had uh, affected family members with different types uh, of dystonia, with musicians' dystonia, but also with other types of dystonia. And here is. Um, a family that we uh, identified, a typical family, I would say. Uh, the index patient um, is a professional pianist. Christina Klein showed the video yesterday uh, with a severe flexion dystonia uh, of the right hand. I think everyone can see that. 
This is a C major scale, so an easy task for a professional pianist. And you see that he's playing on, on his knuckles. And the left hand is unaffected. So a clear musician's Estonia. And interestingly, his sister and his mother uh, suffer from writer's cramp. And here's uh, the video of the mother. You can see a severe right-sided writer's cramp affecting the whole arm. <clears throat> yeah, and we identified a lot of these families, similar families to that uh, during our studies. And interestingly, we could also identify the first molecular genetic uh, risk factors uh, of musicians dystonia. I don't want to go in too much into the details, but one factor is uh, the GAC deletion in the TOR1A, the DUT1 gene, that can also cause musicians dystonia in rare cases. Then we identified a variant in a gene called aryl sulfatase G. And uh, what is the consequence of that? Uh, musicians carrying this variant have an over fourfold increased risk uh, to develop musicians dystonia, so an interesting uh, result. And uh, the last uh, factor that we identified recently uh, are mutations in a gene called rep 12 And um, all these factors are present only in a minority of the patients, of course, and less is known about the functional consequences of these variants in the cell, uh, especially uh, concerning the last two uh, mutations and variants. So uh, today, this pathophysiological model uh, for the development of musicians' dystonia is suggested, although due to our uh, studies, on the basis of a genetic predisposition, additional triggering factors uh, may lead to a so-called endophenotype, as yet undefined for musicians' dystonia, and at last to the manifestation of the disease. And uh, the genetic susceptibility uh, includes, for example, a positive family history, as I said, uh, for dystonia, and also all the genetic factors, uh, molecular genetic factors that we identified. And the triggering factors <clears throat> can be divided into intrinsic uh, and extrinsic triggering factors and include all the factors that I, the risk factors that I described earlier. For example, okay, <laughs> for example, high temporal spatial constraints on the instrument, the typical uh, social constraints of classical music, playing without notes, making no mistakes, and so on. Uh, special personality profiles like uh, prominent anxiety and perfectionism and local pain, overuse, or nerve trauma. And if, if these triggering factors uh, come together with a genetic predisposition, then a person may develop musician's dystonia. That's the current pathophysiological model of the disease. Okay, um, now what are the therapeutic options? I, I will cover only uh, three ones. Uh, so for the therapy of musician's dystonia, medication is important. The injection of botulinum toxin in affected muscles is suitable especially uh, for hand dystonia patients with a clear and simple uh, contraction pattern where you can clearly identify the pathologic mu muscle and inject the toxin. For all other patients, for hand dystonia patients with a comp more complex pattern or embouchure dystonia patients, tri trihexyphenidyl uh, may also be an option or or first choice uh, treatment. And I think something what is special for musicians' dystonia is the pedagogical retraining that aims to uh, replace pathologic dystonic movements on the instrument with uh, healthy movements. And the retraining is a real, uh, yeah, may last over a long time period, a period over years, and is a heart therapy uh, that, that is not easy for the patients. And then we have the ergonomic changes of the instrument or the instrumental playing. And uh, these are often good ter therapeutic options and should always be taken into account when treating patients with musician's dystonia. And with all these therapeutic options and, and some others that I have not mentioned now, <coughs> um, we are able to help the vast majority uh, of our patients. However, um, 
the playing is nevertheless often uh, impaired, slightly impaired, under therapy, and that is the problem uh, with the therapy, and therefore the prevention is so important and, and a really important issue in musicians' dystonia. And if you remember all the risk factors that I presented, um, we think that active prevention is possible and necessary in three, three areas, or two, mainly two areas. One is uh, local pain and overuse syndromes. Um, the second is anxiety uh, and perfectionism. And you cannot possibly also counsel patients concerning the genetic risk uh, to develop the disorder. I think that's not really a preventive strategy, but the other two are. Um, so in, in Berlin at the Kurt Singer Institute, that's an institute at the music schools, in, uh, which I'm heading in, in Berlin, uh, we offer an intensive course program um, for our music students, which focuses on the uh, prevention of musicians' dystonia and uh, musicians', musicians diseases in general and on health. And that includes uh, a lot of courses, lectures and practice seminars on music physiology and uh, voice physiology, then preventive sport courses, body awareness techniques like Alexander Technique or Feldenkrais, and special mental and performance training courses the musicians in the room will probably know all these uh, techniques and courses. And uh, aim is to prevent dystonia, pain, anxiety, and to prevent disease. And we also offer a music physiological uh, counseling for our students uh, where we try to prevent playing-related physical and psychological uh, problems. In addition to this work on the music schools we have in Berlin, uh, uh, we offer also an, an outpatient clinic for musicians' diseases, a special clinic only for musicians. Um, and this is at the Charité, the uh, university hospital in Berlin. And we have uh, founded the Berlin Center for Musicians' Medicine. And uh, there we treat musicians. And within this center, uh, musicians with dystonia are treated in the neurology uh, departed and, uh, department and together with experts from there. And we do also make research in this in the field. Okay, then I come to the end. Let me please summarize uh, the key aspects of my talk. I hope you understood that musician dystonia is a career-limiting neurological movement disorder. Several environmental and also genetic risk factors contribute to the etiology. That's a real new uh, aspect of the disorder. And the therapy includes medication, pedagogical retraining, and ergonomic changes. And as I said, it is helpful, but limited uh, concerning professional musicians. And the prevention is therefore necessary and done in Berlin and in Germany in several other music schools as well. And let me please acknowledge some of the mentioned persons here, uh, especially Professor Altenmüller, where I made my thesis in Hanover and Professor Klein, where I did my resi residency, and my new colleagues in Berlin for the uh, collaboration and the support. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>